Dr. Vaidhi completed her MD global training and did her overseas training at Allen Brooks Hospitals in his trust in 2016. She will be talking on environmental surface disinfection during COVID-19 outbreak. Over to you, Vaidhi. Uh, th th thank you, Madam, for your kind words. Uh, um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the college uh, and uh, uh, PSLME um, uh, and WHO for giving me this such opportunity. So I'm presenting the, uh, uh, the slides which are prepared for part of a uh, uh, collaborative project uh, by WHO uh, College of Microbiologists uh, with the ministry. Uh, and uh, this is for the continuous uh, uh, professional development or uh, knowledge enhancement uh, to handle uh, the outbreak in Sri Lanka. So this, uh, the topic given to me was environmental surface disinfection do, during COVID outbreak. So because it's so, so important and uh, so it has become so popular uh, soon after the pandemic. So then uh, we need to discuss certain points. So that's the. So. So I'm starting with the, uh, the, the definitions uh, because everyone knows, but just to uh, rem uh, remember, remind certain things. So the disinfection, antiseptics, and cleaning. So look similar, but they have, uh, uh, they have definitely a specific meaning. So disinfection is a process that eliminates uh, um, all um, pathogens or most of the pathogens, but it doesn't eliminate the bacterial spores. But it's 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 only it's referring to only to the inanimate things, inanimate or non-living objects, not uh, the living objects. So when it comes to antiseptics, similar, but it it addresses the living tissue. Cleaning is a good old cleaning that is we just removing the visible uh, soiling or dirty things using general purpose the, 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 the soap and water like things. So we just just mechanically um, clean the clean the dirt parts. So that's a cleaning. So disinfection on non-living and antiseptics on living tissues and cleaning is just a removal of um, a, a visible dirt part. So um, uh, this uh, this is a chart. It's, it's, it's very useful because uh, household disinfectant. So whenever we talk about healthcare facility, that's something. But when you come to, because of the pandemic now, everyone is alert and uh, people want to do disinfection and things. Okay, I, I hope you all can see now. Uh, so then, uh, um, uh, it, it tried the, the the chart trying to address the common items or services uh, which we want to clean. So, for example, telephones, keys, spectacles that we we usually bring out bring home after after going out. So, what we can do to those things? So, we can just clean and wipe with alcohol um, uh, and or with warm soapy water after returning home. Uh, so. Uh, so frequently touched surfaces like uh, tables, door handles, light switches, those are the things what we can do. We can regularly wash with, uh, clean with household detergent or all-purpose cleaners like uh, BKC, that is uh, benzalkonium chloride solution like that, or even chlorine uh, preparations in low concentration, we can do that. And uh, fruits and vegetables, again, we can clean with running water as we know, know well. Uh, so this is uh, this recommendation for general household disinfection where you don't have a patient or you don't have a suspected patient. So, but uh, the, the main thing is uh, we, we should not uh, touch the face while performing any cleaning because it, it two purposes, only thing that you can infect yourself and the other thing is uh, that we can, uh, the, the irritation of eyes and mucous membranes due to the chemicals we use for disinfection and uh, antisepsis. So then, uh, when we consider a house uh, disinfection of household items, when a suspected COVID patient's there, so where we have to extensive cleaning, extensive disinfection should be uh, we have to practice. And again, we can clean and disinfect high touch surfaces in daily uh, daily in household common areas like tables, hard back chairs, and doorknobs and light switches and handles and all, uh, at least daily. And uh, we should remember, we should clean before disinfection. If you see any any um, dirt or soil that, that spilled food or anything, that should be cleaned before we um, uh, disinfect. Because we all know that uh, disinfection, use, uh, we are using chemicals which are readily inactivated by um, organic particles. 
So cleaning is important before we disinfect any surfaces. So while, uh, while cleaning the surfaces, uh, we need to wear heavy duty gloves, uh, preferably uh, up to the elbow. And that should be dedicated for cleaning and disinfection purposes. Uh, so that is, uh, that's the, uh, the good habit. And uh, it should not be used for other purposes. And uh, whenever we use chemicals for disinfection, we should not forget to uh, read the manufacturer's instruction because uh, uh, each chemical, each chemical component may differ and the manufacturer would have given a, a specific uh, set of instructions for preparation and usage. And we should clean hands immediately after removing the gloves, uh, uh, immediately after removing the gloves. Because we may think that we are protected. Yes, we are, but still, after removal of the gloves, we should clean our hands to, uh, for, uh, for safety. And if surfaces are dirty, as we discussed earlier, we should clean it before we apply any chemicals for disinfection purposes. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. So cleaning spills. So whenever there is a spill, then uh, that's it, 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 it can be either blood or vomitus or anything that's a spill. So then we need to, this organic matter will definitely inactivate disinfectant. So, and the, the, other, the other important thing is we should not allow the spill to spread over the surfaces. So we usually put, a, uh, put some, something which can absorb the thing which is spilled. Uh, that can be cotton or wadding or, or even some piece of cloth to put it and then uh, let it absorb the whatever. Then uh, it can be removed with the, uh, uh, with the heavy duty glove, the hands. Um, and after that, we need to thoroughly clean and then hypochlorite. But um, uh, in healthcare settings, we usually, after putting the absorbent materials, we pour the uh, disinfectant that is usually hypochlorite into that and then remove it and then cleaning. But in household settings, then we can remove the spill and then we can clean it because the risk is low. Next slide, please. Okay, so then next question comes is how frequently we need to clean it. So in general recommendation is we can clean daily the uh, commonly used items like uh, door handles, railings, <clears throat> light switches and tabletops and all. But whenever it comes at the frequently, more frequent cleaning of tables and um, uh, sorry, telephones and uh, computer keyboards and all, uh, maybe uh, twice a day or more with uh, suitable uh, disinfectants. And uh, we, we, as we earlier told, that we have to uh, perform hand hygiene, frequently wash hands, uh, especially after any task that involving cleaning and disinfection. And the wipes or whatever we use to clean or apply the uh, disinfectants on the surfaces should be carefully disposed. And if you are reusing, if you are reusing, then it should be washed and uh, should be um, uh, disinfected and uh, under sun dry. That's very important. We can re definitely reuse after this. Yeah. Next slide, please. So then we are, uh, this, uh, uh, this is again a useful table because uh, I can remember from the beginning, I, I, was, uh, I was receiving calls from various parts of the, the, the Eastern region asking for how to prepare uh, the chlorine solution, how much we have to put, how much we have to put, how long we can keep like this. It's very common questions and problems. And now I think everyone is uh, up to date, uh, but still it's useful. So we can have uh, bleach in liquid form or powder form. So liquid form, it's called household bleach. Uh, the, the, the common brand name is Clorox. So it has, it has, it contains sodium hypochlorite in a five to six percent solution. And we can dilute into, dilute accordingly to get 0.1 percent solution. But it should be freshly prepared. That means if we are preparing in the morning, we can use the same solution for the, for the entire day. But the next day, we have to prepare a fresh solution. We can't keep because it will reduce the potency. So bleach powder, because it comes in different, different concentrations, sometimes 30%, sometimes 70%, sometimes in between. So here's a very useful formula. I am not going to explain, it's just mathematical. So then uh, we, the, depending on the percentage, we have to add how much grams in uh, one liter and we can prepare accordingly. Okay? So, and the other, uh, and the main thing is, um, we should be when we prepare uh, chlorine preparation um, uh, with the, we should be a well ventilated area if it is a household household work so we can do it in the outside the house in the garden 
a well ventilated area because otherwise the chlorine will irritate uh, when you prepare and because and the, the the contact time that we need to leave the uh, chlorine preparation when you apply for the surfaces uh, for 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 10 minutes because for the to to exert uh, that, that for its action effective action otherwise the contact time um, is also important so then surgical spirit there's the next one but uh, that is kind of, when you compare to bleach it's costly uh, but it's uh, useful when you come to the uh, uh, metal surfaces um, uh, so we are alcohol we can use but bleach we cannot and uh, the general purpose cleaning or uh, general purpose disinfection in household uh, uh, household products we can use uh, bkc then zirconium chloride uh, and it can be used neat or dilute one is to one so but that needs 20 minutes contact time for for alcohol it's quick because uh, it it doesn't need to wipe off again you can apply and leave it uh, because it will evaporate so bleach alcohol and benzocone yeah so yeah right next slide yeah thank you so bleach uh, uh, we use bleach 0.1 percent for the surface cleaning including the uh, touchable surfaces and flow but we are using 0.5 percent in household for especially for toilets and bathroom cleaning where you expect more uh, contamination so yeah here this caution is can cause corrosion on metal surfaces in the long term use if not wiped off properly and we all have experience i believe uh, because in with uh, with covid we we use a lot of chlorine a lot of hypochlorite solution and uh, you can see in your covid unit if you have in your uh, boards uh, uh, that uh, the, the the metal surfaces started the, the the corrosive action of chlorine is obvious uh, it's corrosive yes and uh, so that uh, to prevent that uh, it should be wiped off after the allocated contact time it should be wiped off with clean water <clears throat> Yeah, and should be we should be we should avoid applying chlorine on on uh, uh, these metal surfaces uh, as far as we can. So um, surgical spirit or ethanol or sixty to eighty percent isopropyl alcohol, it's uh, it's very user friendly um, but costly. We had time when we didn't have alcohol at hospitals and it was like a huge issue. And luckily, we have got some uh, supply from uh, Galoya, uh, uh, this uh, Galoya factory, uh, and that's 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 the same alcohol we are still using for last two and a half three months. Uh, that was really useful thing. So this is sixty to eighty percent, and it's the contact time is very uh, when you compare to chlorine, it's just three to five minutes, and it just evaporates. So it's a, it's a very useful thing on metal surfaces and all. But cost and availability should be considered before applying on it. And BKC, it's a general surface uh, products, including plastics and everything we can apply. So uh, yeah, that is, again, a useful one in household uh, purposes. Next slide, please. OK, so I'm coming to the attractive uh, thing, uh, but uh, uh, I think it's uh, the bold one, not recommend that people don't like uh, to hear this. I know because everyone is willing to do spraying disinfectants everywhere. So this spraying is the problem, that, uh, but it's not recommended by WHO or College of Microbiologists, yeah? because spraying disinfectants can result in, um, uh, sorry, I'm seeing the messages, the sound is not clear and screen text not clear. Is that so? Is that everything okay now? Organizers, is everything okay? So I have, I can see on the chats that, okay, now oh, I can see now, okay, now clear, right, that's good, okay. So spraying of disinfectants and we don't recommend because of the reason we listed down here, because when you spray the risk to the eyes, respiratory skin irritation, and that's more than the effect we expect on the bacteria or virus or whatever. And the spraying or fogging of certain chemicals such as formaldehyde or chlorine-based agents or quaternary ammonium compounds not recommended due to adverse health effects on workers in facilities where these methods have been utilized. Yes, so that is very, very important. Even though they are wearing the adequate PPE, but the, the effectiveness of spraying is very questionable. So whether are we doing the right thing or wrong thing, we should consider. And if disinfectants are to be applied, yes, this should be done with a cloth or wipe it off. That, that's the cloth which soaked in that particular disinfectant can be used to wipe off the surface surfaces. Right? 
And in case of chlorine, we have to wipe off immediately uh, or five to 10 minutes later with clean water as well to prevent corrosive action on metal surfaces. Right. So in continuing the spraying of disinfection and the other uh, no touch methods, uh, so uh, the, the, the other, other thing, other attractive thing people are doing, media is publishing all over the world, it's being utilized, but we actually don't know the efficacy in outdoor spaces, spraying or fumigation out of outdoor spaces, such as streets or marketplaces, it's, it's very questionable because it's, uh, it has lots of organic materials. It can be either dirt or natural organic materials. When you spray these disinfectants on it, as far as we know, that doesn't have any effect because the, the disinfectants we are spraying on them will be immediately deactivated by the organic materials present on the surfaces. And moreover, if it is on an outside surface in Sri Lanka, like country like Sri Lanka, where the temperature is so hot, we are getting that uh, UV light directly from the sun. The UVC, which is uh, more effective against um, infective agents, is, is more in the temperate, the, the, the countries which are near the, uh, the countries like Sri Lanka. So we, are, uh, so we, we, we have that advantage. And uh, with the well ventilated, uh, well uh, lit um, outside spaces, what's the point of spraying is really a questionable thing. So cleaning the touchable surfaces is different, but spraying outdoor is entirely um, a different thing. And it's not recommended because it's not effective. And the other thing is, other thing we should understand, that we have seen media enough and enough time. They spray on people, uh, they, are, they are with all this, uh, the, uh, their normal dress and lip. So, so this, this, the, the clothes are porous surfaces such as, so then uh, these things and the uh, unpaved walkways and things, when you spray, so then it doesn't have a, um, we, there is no scientific evidence which has effect. So we need to think whether what we are doing, we are with panic, we are doing thing, things, but it doesn't have a scientific basis. Next slide, please. Uh, so it's continuing. So that's spraying on individuals with disinfectant. That's why that's such as internal and cabinet or chamber. Uh, so I have I have received a call in early April, like uh, one of our faculty uh, students, uh, uh, nursing students, and they have uh, they have asked me. So they they are trying to uh, design a, um, a like a disinfectant chamber and uh, give my ideas. And I told them, I'm sorry, I cannot, and I don't recommend because that, that that doesn't have a meaning because because of the media so they are very attractive and they want to do that and they think if a person goes through the chamber they are sterilized so it's it's not like that so it's not recommended under any circumstances that we should understand and uh, it could be physically and psychologically harmful it's very very important and would not reduce an infected person's ability to spread so it doesn't have any effect on infected person's ability to spread the virus yeah that's the important thing and uh, uh, moreover, spraying individuals with chlorine and other toxic metals will cause more harm than any good. So, next slide, please. So, um, uh, uh, this is very, very important slide because it's a novel disease and information will em emerge daily. And so the recommendations may change. So we need to keep ourselves updated and change practices as indicated at the given time. So we should be, uh, we should know that. So these are uh, the references. Thank you very much for the opportunities. Uh, I would like to answer any questions. I can see a question on the chat uh, that um, whether the frequently touched surfaces like doorknob and light switches can be cleaned like thrice a day or more. So the, the our slides showed it's um, uh, at least twice a day. And another thing I am sure seeing, spraying is still happening even in the airport, etc. Uh, they, oh, so many things are coming. They, um, they, they, are, they are spraying on the hands and the feet and shoes, etc. I'm really sorry. Yes, we are also seeing, I don't know how to stop these things. Uh, people believe in these things and uh, I, I actually don't know what to do. And I also, I'm also seeing some other question. What is the place of chlorhexidine for cleaning and disinfection? Yes, chlorhexidine is an antiseptic agent. So we, we the, and that's very costly. And I don't think that we can recommend chlorhexidine for surface disinfection. Madam, uh, Madam, suggestion if there's any. 
and i can see another question do we need to wash fruits and vegetables with soap and water yes uh, it's not that indicated we can wash with running water but we can use even uh, soap and water or even hypochlorite that is cdc recommends in 0.05% very low concentration and another question i am seeing is dipping shoes in chlorine tub has value uh, yes it has value um, especially in the healthcare settings i don't think in a routine household practice we need to dip shoes in chlorine tub the the main thing i would like to uh, focus here the take home message is that uh, a spraying a spraying outdoor should be and spraying out and spraying on individual should be considered seriously and we have to try our maximum to stop that cannot tolerate any more uh, i can see some more questions here sir uh, maximum time duration that a kn95 n95 can be used yes uh, we cannot say because it depends on the uh, on where you are using it uh, and if you are sweating a lot and your mask is wet or you have uh, you have faced a splash on your face then you have to immediately remove otherwise you can use uh, as far as you can and another thing i can uh, see how often do we need to clean the door handle per day at least daily yeah and another thing i am seeing here how long we can use a normal surgical mask again the same answer so if you are wearing on a very humid environment or very humid the room or uh, whatever the ward or uh, wherever you work if you are start sweating and your mask is wet inside then you need to remove and change yeah uh, i hope it's uh, 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 the presentation is useful and thank you again for the organizers and the uh, uh, college thank you uh, the next presentation uh, is uh, from the dr april baller uh, joining us from the who health emergencies from the headquarters geneva over to you april so thank you all so much My name is uh, April Baller, Dr. April Baller. I work in WHO HQ, as was mentioned, in Geneva, uh, within the WHO Health Emergency Department, uh, and I'm, I'm the IPC lead here. We work very close. We're a big IPC team that works in the health emergency, but also in the global IPC hub, which is part of the essential services. In addition to that, we have many regional IPC focal persons, um, and we have our colleague. from Siro Masahiro and also Dr Pushpa so i just want to acknowledge everybody and all the work that has been done has been done as a team um so thank you for this opportunity and today i have the privilege to speak about uh covid infections among healthcare workers what we know so the agenda items are we're going to be looking a little bit around the epidemiology the burden of the disease some of the risk factors for healthcare workers becoming infected the psychosocial and uh, psychological impact of of the disease and having to manage patients with the disease and finally some of the available tools that that there are to address some of these issues so um first and foremost we all appreciate that uh the health workers have played an extraordinary role in the response to this pandemic I think if there's been one silver lining uh of all of this it's to the, the public and also the 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 governments have started to acknowledge the important role of healthcare workers. Uh what you see here is a report that was done by Amnesty International uh and uh, it was really a call for action because in spite of all of the good work that they've done and the enormous challenges that they face the governments have not adequately uh, protected them um when they have raised concerns there has been reprisal uh either from the the hospital authorities or also from the government authorities and some of the challenges that they're facing on a global level is related to shortages of personal protective equipment ppe and adequate pay and compensation in case of becoming ill or death and stigma so the amnesty report um talk asks or right makes recommendations for governments uh specifically around health workers ensuring that all health workers should have an adequate ppe uh that covid should be recognized as an occupational disease and workers should be compensated uh if they need to take time off their concerns should be listened to and addressed 
any attacks or violence against health workers must be promptly investigated. There has been, uh, this has been a concern in, in several countries. And also that review should be carried out about the actual level of preparedness for pandemics within states. And finally, a big call out for collecting and publishing data by occupation. Uh, another report that came out uh, recently was from the International Council of Nurses. You can see the, the link here. And here what, we're trying, what they're trying to do is understand a bit more how many uh, health workers are infected. As you'll see shortly, this is a big question. Unfortunately, we don't have the answer for that. Um, in this report, they said that over 100 nurses have died with an uh, approximation of over 90,000 health workers who have become infected. Um, and this was data that was collected from 30 countries. From those 30 countries, there was a range of zero to 18% of all cases which were due to healthcare workers' infection. Here, I'd just like to share uh, with you the WHO, uh, basically it's called the Global Surveillance Case Reporting. So this is a case form which hopefully uh, many of you are, are aware of where they actually uh, collect all the data with respect to each case. And what you, the main message to take home here is um, in addition to the numbers is the actual underreporting. So here, according to the data that WHO has collected, which is on a voluntary basis, there's 192,046 healthcare worker uh, infections that have been reported. As you can see here for Afro, uh, the region of Afro, it's saying zero and for zero it's 15 and I'm sure it's much more than that. Unfortunately, um, this is one of the major challenges is there's no systematic way to report how many healthcare workers are infected uh, as this is voluntary. So uh, there's really difficulty in understanding um, how big of a problem this is. Uh, down below, you'll see a graph which shows the numbers. And as you can see, the trend uh, it was higher in, in the month of, of April and uh, has slightly gone down over the months of June and July. Also within that uh, data reporting, there were some very basic characteristics. Uh, so in particular that the majority of health workers uh, are female. So it was a 70% versus 30% that were male and uh, 12 of them percent were known to have comorbidities, but uh, within that 40% were unknown. Um, in addition to that, the age is approximately 40. Um, and for, for zero is about 35 years old um, is the average age for the healthcare worker. And down below in the little table, you can see as well some of the information that's collected healthcare workers who have become infected, how many have required ICU, 743, and how many reported deaths is the 232. So this is just some of the very basic data that is available. Um, from WHO. Here we're going to go on and just look at a few other reports around trying to understand what is the impact of the healthcare workers, how many are actually infected globally. So on your left side, you see here a um, morbidity and mortality weekly report that came out a couple of months ago. And there was is a US study where they were looking about 315,000 cases. Unfortunately, only 16% of them had occupational information. However, however of those 19% were healthcare workers. Once again, there was more females than males. And an interesting point here was, where was the contact that they had with a COVID patient? And which setting was this? We'll go into this a little bit later, but I think it's very important to understand that it's not just um, in healthcare facility settings. Here they had 55% and 27% reported having contact with a case in the household and 13 in the community. So the potential for exposure can be in multiple settings. Um, and this makes it more complex to really understand how to stop the, the, change of trans, the chains of transmission. On the right side, you can see some of the characteristics as well. 
Here is another study, and this is an excellent uh, review. It's a living rapid review, which is by Dr. Ro uh, Roger Cho, and it was last updated 21st of July. So if you're interested to learn more about healthcare workers, I would uh, recommend to look this up. And uh, in summary, he says healthcare workers experience significant burden from COVID infections, including uh, um, COVID-19. Uh, uh, there was different burdens of disease depending on the country. So some of the data they collected from Netherlands showed 6.4% uh, of health workers um, out, of, out of the total of all cases in China. There was two reports, one which was from earlier in the year, one a little bit later, which showed 3.8 and then 5.1 respectively. The take home message here is that the overall incidence is higher in health workers than the general population. However, the actual illness severity and mortality is apparently uh, lower. And here is once again another study that was done. It was actually a rapid response report uh, by uh, Alberta Health Services in Canada, where they were also looking at the risk of healthcare workers becoming infected and the case fatality rate. So on the right side, you can see they looked at high risk countries versus low risk countries and uh, the risk for healthcare workers to become infected was actually 11, sorry, 9 to 11 times higher. However, their fatality rate was lower than the general population. And uh, one more on, on just looking at mortality in general of healthcare workers from the UK, uh, where they found that uh, the, 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 the number that was uh, of, of health workers who died between March and May was 147. Um, and an interesting part that came out of that report, which is also something that's being seen in other countries, is that there's certain groups of health workers who have been disproportionately affected. Here they have what they call the, the BAME um, health workers, which is from, um, uh, I think it was is Asian, British, yeah, uh, oh, sorry, Blacks, Asian and minority ethical groups. So saying that even though within the healthcare workers who do become infected, those that actually go on to develop severe disease are, are is a disproportionate and this is also something I'm sure you've been hearing about from, from the states where they're looking at more the Latino groups um, and certain uh, ethical groups which seem to be uh, have a higher impact. When they were looking at the mortality rates and seeing what were some of the, the reasons for the lower mortality, they, uh, they, the assumptions was that it was due to greater access to PPE, uh, having fewer older people working as health workers compared to the general population, and then also due to increased access of, to testing. Um, and now we move on some from more of the physical uh, issues for where healthcare workers who become infected to the psychosocial and the burden of disease. So once again, from the CHO uh, review, they're looking at some of the mental health issues, which are common. And uh, they found that 14 to 15% of all health workers uh, were clinically depressed. Uh, 12 to 24% uh, had anxiety, 30 to 39% psychological distress, and between 80 to 60%, 8 to 60% had sleep issues. And the risk factors for this was being female, having direct contact with cases, and being a nurse. And on the bottom right, you, there's another report there where they uh, did a deep dive and looked at some of these psychological burdens. It was in Germany and saw and noted that especially nurses working in wards were affected psychologically compared to physicians or doctors. And here is another interesting article. This is looking also at the impact uh, on healthcare workers psychologically. However, this was not just looking at COVID, this was also looking at any emerging um, viral disease. And what you can see here on the right side is uh, they, were, they were comparing uh, some MERS and SARS, uh, Ebola, um, between staff who were exposed to managing patients with those versus uh, the control with staff not uh, managing infectious disease. And what they found here was that um, those who were exposed to the virus had higher levels of, uh, had a greater level of post-traumatic stress uh, 
uh, and also psychological distress. And some of the risk factors are, are mentioned here. I won't go into that. Um, so this is quite interesting to see that, yes, right now during the COVID, there is a lot of psychological uh, concerns, but these are things that come up uh, with, with other infectious disease outbreaks as well. And then here, this is taking a step back and looking at healthcare workers infection within the context of hospital acquired infections. Um, as uh, you know, healthcare workers infection is one component of hospital acquired infection. And what's interesting here, if you look on the right side, is these are showing what they were doing here is they were looking at what are the contributions uh, to transmission. So what are the different ways that transmission can happen? And uh, it's quite, uh, it, there's a quite a lot of variability. And what you can see is that uh, anywhere you see a red arrow, this is the potential way that the transmission can happen. So between staff, between patient to staff, between patient to patient, between visitors to staff and patient, and this is just in the hospital setting. You also have the interaction between of course, the hospital setting and the home setting. Then you have the interaction between the community and the hospital. For example, if people are coming uh, in to, uh, you know, to provide food. And then there's also uh, links between the hospital and the care home. So it's just to show it's quite a, uh, it's a, quite a complex environment where transmission can be happening in many different uh, areas. And therefore, to, to identify policies and strategies uh, also needs to take this into consideration. Um, and what they did here as well is that they looked at what were some of the inadequate IPC infection prevention and control practices, which led to the hospital acquired COVID. And once again, this was linked to failure to use PPE, inadequate hand hygiene, uh, not properly disinfecting surfaces. Uh, so just to acknowledge and appreciate the, the speaker before, Dr. Galagodan, who, who really emphasized the importance of that. Um, and then uh, lack of appropriate physical distancing and importantly also to separate infected from non-infected patients and staff who are looking after them. So uh, in summary, the impacts of the healthcare workers' infections, in addition to the impact on the individual healthcare worker and their, and their close and loved ones, it's also the potential for further transmission within the community and the healthcare facility. The impact on the health system, of course, is that uh, health workers, they have, to, they have to be taken out of the system and this uh, leads to workforce depletion and a heavier load on the remaining staff, which once again exposes them to a higher risk of becoming infected. And then the society impact is that the communities can have increased mistrust in the services. Uh, now we're going to go into just briefly some of the risk factors. Um, and this was very, also very uh, insightful, where it looked at uh, really what was the increased risk uh, in certain areas. And one of the highest risk, as was mentioned earlier, was having suboptimal hand washing before or after patient contact. This increased the risk by three. Um, improper use of PPE almost by three as well. Working in high risk departments such as ICU or emergency departments increase the risk by, by two. Um, and then insufficient education and training. This is just, a, uh, uh, just an interesting view on um, some information that was captured from, from Liberia and West Africa, where they were looking at uh, what were some of the breaches in IPC. Uh, and this is consistent with the previous slide, which showed that uh, up to 30% uh, we're not uh, doing hand hygiene before a procedure, and 16% uh, uh, weren't doing uh, hand hygiene after a procedure. And importantly here, that 35% uh, were not using the mask when they were supposed to. Uh, and then when it was asked why, then it was because they explained that they had limited supplies and that often healthier workers had to use fabric mask instead of the medical mask. And also very importantly, the limited monitoring of the IPC program. We don't have time to go into this today, but um, the minimum standards of an IPC program need to be in place to really ensure that uh, IPC practices are maintained. So if countries don't have these programs in place, it becomes very challenging for them to address all of these issues in the height of an, an outbreak. 
Here, just very quickly, uh, in the interest of time, this was a, a report that was looking at what are some of the barriers to health workers adhering to IPC guidelines. There are many guidelines out, and I will come to those in a minute from WHO side, but of course also at national level. And uh, one of the challenges they seem to have is that, that the, the, the guidelines are long, they're constantly changing, there's not a lot of buy-in to them. Um, in addition to that, they don't necessarily have the time to be properly trained. Another key area that was a challenge for, for workers to actually implement the guidelines was related to the infrastructure and the lack of space to isolate patients. Uh, this is very important and something that they found that was helpful was that if all of the staff uh, were on board to implement the guidelines. So here we're just transitioning the last couple of slides to looking at some of the tools that are available for health workers. We've discussed some of the main problems. Now, how are they addressed? Some of them can be addressed um, and others are obviously uh, uh, major research questions that need to that are being looked at as we move forward. So there are some uh, studies that are ongoing. There's a case control study that's available on the WHO website and a surveillance protocol. And what these are trying to do is um, really understand a bit more in depth what are some of the risk factors for healthcare workers infection. In addition to that, there's this risk assessment, uh, which is available online on the WHO website as well. Um, and hopefully it's being used in some of the health facilities where you're where you're all working. And this, what it does is it helps to identify health workers that have been exposed to a case if they're high or low risk, uh, and then how they should be managed. In addition to that, WHO has many guidance out. There's about 10 specifically on IPC. And just to highlight to the group here, uh, one of the main uh, uh, new updates is on the advice of the use of masks in the context of COVID. And for here, what's now recommended in the latest uh, version that came out on the 5th of June is that all health care workers that are in a hospital should wear uh, a medical slash surgical mask when they're seeing any patients, irrespective of if they're COVID or not. And this is taking into consideration the potential for asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission. Uh, and then there's many tra training, online trainings, which are free, and I hope that everybody uh, will, has access to these, or if not, that they will after this. Um, and this includes uh, training modules, PowerPoint presentations, videos on how to take put on and take off PPE, and there are posters as well. There's been approximately almost 500,000 people which have accessed these trainings. Uh, there are also some specific recommendations for psychological issues, uh, and you can read about this, uh, in this in this reference, and it really talks about, in addition to individual factors, there's also service factors that the health facility and management team should take into consideration um, to really support the healthcare workers. And finally, just to close, to uh, some of the... Um, actions that are being taken to address the shortages of, of PPE. So WHO in collaboration with many of the UN partners have put, uh, have established the COVID supply chain system. Here, what they're doing is trying to coordinate the demand uh, globally with the supplies that are available and then the actual distribution through the WFP. Uh, and this is a new project um, and uh, the allocation you can see here of the different PPEs that went out during, the May, uh, during June and July of this year. So uh, this is just a link to many of the documents and resources and to say thank you to the present uh, to the organizers for this opportunity and uh, happy to take any questions over to you okay there's one question coming uh, is that airborne infection now so yes thank you very much that's a very important question um, and the there is so there's two contexts there's the context within the healthcare facility uh, and in the healthcare facility settings where there's aerosol generating procedures such as intubation. So this is something that's been 
uh, known for for some time. In those contexts, yes, there are there is uh, potential for airborne transmission, which is why healthcare workers should wear the N95, the respirator. Um, outside of the healthcare facility setting, which is really what a lot of the discussions has been on lately, there are certain settings where there has been uh, super spreader events and uh, in, in specific settings which are closed settings, for example, uh, in bars or where there's been a choir, there's um, a very good uh, WHO scientific brief on modes of transmission and identifies many of these settings. And uh, in those settings where it's been closed, where there's been a lot of people where the ventilation hasn't been good and people have been together for quite some period of time, there is a question whether there is airborne transmission. So the possibility is, is, is yes. What's not known is uh, if it is happening, what is the percentage of the overall transmission? Uh, there's still uh, WHO, um, still uh, says that droplet and contact transmission are the main modes of transmission. Some of the discussions around the airborne have been looking at uh, laboratory experimental where they've been able to, to project uh, viruses. So until now, this is still under debate uh, and uh, watching the space and really requesting that there should be more research done to better understand this. Over to you. Uh, one more question, uh, that's the, uh, what's the difference in efficacy between the cloth mask and the uh, N95 and the surgical? Yeah, thank you. So are the participants. It's a good question. So the surgical mask is a protective uh, piece of equipment. So this has been something, the, the surgical mask or the also known as medical mask have certain standards that they have to adhere to and they are actually uh, there's quality assurance, so they're ensured that they actually provide the protection that they that they say they do. Cloth masks are something that are generally uh, made either in the community or even made at home. So they provide a barrier, but it's not clear how much of a barrier they provide. That's why cloth masks, uh, WHO is... Uh, encouraging the use of cloth masks for source control, which means that in, to stop a person who's infected from infecting somebody else, uh, because the idea is that there's bigger droplets, so it can capture that. But to cloth masks, there is no evidence uh, to show that there's something that to prevent somebody who's not infected from becoming infected. So at the moment, uh, they are really, um, uh, the advice is to use them to stop one person infecting another, but not to stop someone becoming infected. Over. Uh, because uh, there are many other questions coming in, but because of the interest of time, we'll be moving to the next presenter. The next presentation will be from here, from Vijayaram House. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Sudat Dharmaratna, who's a director of the director of healthcare quality and safety, and uh, from WHO country office, and he'll be talking about the role of medical administrator in supporting IPC programs and training at the hospital level based on eight competency WHO framework. Okay, this is the outline of my presentation. So I will discuss in detail about each of these areas. So there are seven domains of healthcare quality, effectiveness, safety, people-centeredness, equity, timeliness, integration, etc. So safety is the, one of the most important domain. So we are trying to reduce harm associated with healthcare to an acceptable minimum. Therefore, IPC is a critical issue in patient safety. Healthcare associated infections prevalence in high, high, in, high income countries is about 7.6% and it's about 10% in low, low and middle income countries. Moreover, resistant infections currently claim at least 50,000 lives, lives each year across Europe and United States, USA. HIV has the most common complication affecting patient safety patients during their stay in the hospital, and one of one third of HIV could be prevented by adopting uh, good IPC practices. So there are eight core components of IPC developed by WHO in 2009, and there are guidelines, implementation, there are recommendations. So namely, it operates at two levels: national level as and acute healthcare facility level. That is hospital level. 
So IPC program, IPC guidelines, IPC addiction training, hospital acquired infection surveillance, multi-model strategies, monitoring, audit and IPC practice and feedback, workload, staffing and better frequency. Build environment, materials and equipment for IPC. So I, I will see how these are interconnected. So these co-components, you can see the IPC programs, it lay the foundation of any, any uh, infection control practice. And there are two other things enabling the environment, the workload, staffing and with occupancy and building environment, materials and equipment. So the guidelines, education, training, surveillance and monitoring and audit and feedback, they are interrelated and interconnected. So core component one, IPC programs in healthcare facility level, an active IPC program should be there with dedicated train team should be in place. So our hospital, they have a uh, dedicated IPC committee, infection control committee headed by consult microbiologists, usually the directors, the more public health, infection control nurses, everybody get together and they meet regularly and aiming at preventing hospital acquired infection and combating MR. At the national level, there should be active standard on national IPC program with clearly defined objectives, functional activities. So we are in the process of establishing this kind of national IPC program uh, in collaboration with College of Microbiologists as early as possible. And it should be linked to the other relevant national programs and with other professional organizations. And IPC guidelines, the evidence-based guidelines should be developed and implemented for the purpose of reducing uh, hospital acquired infection. And then after education training is very, very important. Based on these guidelines, we have trained the staff. Moreover, monitoring, monitoring of the adherence of the guidelines is very, very important because we know there are, we know what to do, but we don't do. So there is no do gap. So we have to monitor the effectiveness of the training, whether it's implemented successfully. This is also training, IPC education training is a third component. And it should be given to whole healthcare workers from the senior managers, uh, from the bottom line uh, staff. For example, the cleaners should be trained about IPC. Then we have to do the periodic, periodic evaluation of effectiveness of the training and assessment of the staff knowledge. And there should be a national IPC program should support the education training of the health workforce. We have to see as it is a very, very important function. And hospital acquired surveillance. In a healthcare facility level, the facility-based surveillance should be performed to guide the IPC interventions to detect outbreaks, including MR surveillance. For example, uh, suppose if there are uh, catheter-related infection or surgical site infections, or maybe cannula site infections, which is very easy to detect. You can ask the nurse uh, during the water in the morning to see the number of uh, patients have been cannulated and number of uh, cannula uh, has been infected. So easily, if there are signs of inflammation, the nursing officer can check uh, and do this surveillance and collect the data for action. And also there are infection control nurses in Sri Lanka, so they also can, uh, with the guidance of the microbiologists, they can come and uh, do the cross-checking. At national level, HIS uh, surveillance programs and network that includes mechanisms for timely data with feedback also very, very important because if there's such kind of data, we can use this data for benchmark some hospitals. And these are the common uh, hospital acquired infections, the UD, UTIs, the surgical site infections, and lower respiratory tract infections, and blood infections. And the core component five is multimodal strategy. So this is very, very important strategy. So this is the way to achieve system change climate and behavior that supports IPC. So it is oriented to prevention. For example, uh, if we detect a catheter-related UDI, maybe ventilator acid pneumonia, or maybe a, a cannula site in, uh, infection, then you have to think about uh, system change with the, what are the, how can we rectify it? So there are five elements, system change, training and education, monitoring feedback, reminders, communication culture of patient safety. Then uh, we have to think about how, how we, how we uh, prevent it by doing some root cause analysis. So IPC activities using multiple studies should be implemented to improve the practices and reduce uh, infection. And national level also, the national IPC program should coordinate and facilitate the implementation of IPC activities through multiple strategies. 
on a nationwide or maybe in a subnational level, regional level. So I'll explain in detail what do you, what do you think about uh, how, how we organize these multiple multi -multi strategies. Example, uh, how to develop an action plan. There's a problem, multiple thinking. So pro our problem may be um, uh, cannula site infections. So what is the issue? There may be, uh, the, we have to sometimes, uh, uh, there may be a uh, problem with the system. The system change is needed. So what resources, inf infrastructure or supplies are required to facilitate the health practice? And who, need to, you know, who needs to be trained and educated to address this identified gap? And who will undertake this task? How will you improve, how will you know that the improvement has taken place? And how will you publicize action on specific measures and promote improvement and the best practice in this area? And how will you make and maintain this as a healthcare priority and engage senior managers, leaders, champions, and opinions. So you have to think about, sometimes you have to change the system. Sometimes you have to do the training and education. Sometimes you have to do the monitoring and evaluation. And then you have to do some communication, disseminations, and promote improvements. And you have to change the culture. So this is the multimodal thinking. So the five elements, the system change, you have to enable the IPC practice, including infrastructure, equipment, supplies, and other resources. And training and education to improve healthcare worker knowledge. And monitor and feedback to assess the problem and drive appropriate change and document practice improvement. And reminders and communication to promote desired actions at the right time, including campaigns. And culture of patient or culture of safety to facilitate, facilitate organizational climate that values the intervention with a focus of involvement of senior managers, champions, or role models. You can take any problem, maybe ventilator surgery pneumonia, maybe uh, surgery site infections. So you can think about what went wrong, where is the problem. So there are multiple strategies to solve this one issue. So these are the, another way we can say, okay, system change, you have to build the system. Then teach it, the training and education, then check it, monitor and evaluation, then sell it. Reminders and communication advocacy and limit the culture change. And co component six is monitoring, audit, and IPC practice on the feedback. So, healthcare at level, the regular monitoring audit should be performed to prevent and control HAI. We conduct hand hygiene audits in our hospitals to support of the infection control nurses. The national level, so, so we have a national IPC monitoring and evaluation program should be established to assess the extent of to, to which the standards are being met and the activities are being performed according to the program's goals and objective. And workload staffing and bed occupancy. So these are enablers. These are only applicable to the acute health capacity only. Recommends that the following elements should be adhered in, in order to reduce the risk of hospital acquired infection. The bed occupancy should not exceed the standard capacity. So one patient for one bed. And distance between the beds at least one meter. Due to this COVID pandemic, maybe more than that, we have to think about. And health work, uh, worker staffing levels should be adequately assigned according to the patient workload. So they recommend one ICN for 100 patients, but in Sri Lanka, we have infection control nurses and nurses in the hospital. So they, we, we can have more nurses. So every ward, there is an infection control nurses and nurses. And they are trained by the College of Microbiologists. And then the built environment, materials, and equipment for IPC at the facility level. The patient care activities should be undertaken in a clean and hygienic environment. So waste management also very, very important. And including wash uh, infrastructure. So that is uh, water and sanitation for health. So drink, drink, you have to think about drinking water quality, sanitation, and services with appropriate IPC materials and equipment. And materials and equipment to perform appropriate hand hygiene made really, should be readily available at the point of care. So these are the basically eight co-components. And if you think about the role of medical administrators, so really medical administrator has a role to play in all the components. There should be a shared leadership. That means not only the medical administrator, they have to work with the other uh, senior uh, members, like consultant microbiologist, and then the uh, infection control nurses, uh, et cetera. The leadership. The leadership provides an official mandate for IPC. Also, it is it is it drives the culture and all the actions, support reactions. Also, the leadership need to ensure necessary and sustainable human resources as well as financial resources, including time to undertake IPC activities. And also, we have to attract and seek with the key stakeholder support. 
So these are the, the stakeholder support is critical. So these are the key players in IBC in a hospital. The following are critical. Everyone has a role to play from the leadership from top to bottom. The following are critical medical administrator, consult microbiologist, and other consultants, the MO public health, senior care nursing officers, or sisters, other nursing officers, infection control nursing officers, public health inspectors, overseers, healthcare assistants, even cleaners, when janitors are important. And organization factors of IPC success, the leadership commitment and IPC program is the layer at the foundation. And team and task based strategies should be in place that are participatory. The IPC should be integrated into complex and multiple linking systems of organizations. So healthcare is very, very complex. There are the, the, the pharmacy department, the beverage department, the dexter department, likewise. So there are uh, we have to uh, think about the cross-functional boundaries and we have to create a positive organizational culture and basic or services as I mentioned earlier. And IPC education training for health workers also very, very important. An essential component for effective IPC guideline information. So training is very much indicated. The Directorate of Quality Healthcare Quality is a place where we can do the training. In addition, the quality microbiology is also providing training. And it should be a part of overall healthcare facility, health facility education strategy, including when there is a new employee comes to the hospital, when he assumes duties, we have to be orientation about IPC. And should be should be for whole all whole all staff, regardless of the level of position. Maybe a top senior manager, maybe a junior manager, maybe a uh, cleaner. So everybody should be educated on IPC. So nine training modules on IPC have been developed by the College of Microbiologists. Jointly with Ministry of Health and World Health Organizations. So now, uh, how we are going to implement the evaluate effectiveness training? So this is the issue. In order to prevent the no-do gap. So these are the references, and I hope that the video has been developed by WHO. So it will elaborate more on about how we are going to do the training, especially in this COVID pandemic. Furthermore, you can download these documents from the WHO, you can go through it and you can learn a lot. So with that, I thank you and I thank WHO and SLMA and the College of Micro for giving this opportunity for me to discuss these things. Thank you. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sudat. Uh, now it's open for questions. If there are questions from the uh, uh, from among the participants, you can ask through messaging or you can raise your hands. If there are no questions uh, at the moment, uh, yeah, there's a lot of appreciation regarding the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sudhar. Let's move into the next presenter. That's uh, Dr. Madhumani Abhayavardhana. We'll be talking about the rational use of EP and infection prevention and control. Uh, Dr. Madhumani, over to you. Uh, good afternoon to all the healthcare personnel who have joined the webinar today. Um, I hope you can hear me. We can hear you. Thank you. Um, so um, I must um, thank all the um, organizing committee for giving me this uh, good opportunity. Um, uh, so my task is uh, to take you through the rational use of uh, PPE and infection prevention and control of COVID-19 in Sri Lanka. So uh, before going to the uh, Actual uh, lecture. Next, please. Uh, I will give you a brief introduction. Coronavirus is a large family. You all know that it, which causes a wide range of illnesses, uh, common cold to more severe diseases. But novel uh, coronavirus is a new strain which was uh, identified in Wuhan uh, in China to, in 2019, last year in December. Next, please. Uh, main modes of transmission of SARS-CoV virus. We have to know the uh, modes of transmission before talk about uh, uh, prevention, really. So, um, main modes of, next please. Um, uh, main modes of transmission is uh, droplets, next, uh, by infected individuals through coughing or sneezing, uh, and contact with persons' respiratory secretions, direct or indirect could be from the directly from the patient or indirectly from fomites. And uh, next, uh, airborne, 
which can happen in, mainly in uh, aerosol uh, generating procedures in hospitals. Next. Uh, so uh, in uh, infection prevention and control, we need to practice few things. Firstly, in hospitals, we know that standard precautions are always we need to follow. And apart from standard precautions, we have to follow appropriate transmission-based precautions and uh, appropriate disinfection practices. Disinfection practices you have heard now a few minutes ago, and uh, appropriate transmission-based uh, precautions means contact precautions, doctor precautions, and airborne precautions. Next. Um, so just to give us a brief idea about standard precaution, which we must follow all, all the time, this is uh, the IA to reduce the risk of transmission from blood uh, bone or other pathogens, uh, both recognized and unrecognized means symptomatic patient as well as asymptomatic. This we should always uh, consider when we handle patients. May, uh, hand hygiene, always and the personal protective e equipment. Uh, then respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, safe injection practices, sharp safety, linen and patient care equipment, cleaning and environment cleaning and waste disposal. Next. So this is standard precautions. Now, when we talk about uh, SARS or COVID-19, we have to additionally prevent the mode of transmission as well. So, firstly, droplet precautions. Next. Mainly, we have to keep the distance. So, droplets drops on you if you are closer to a patient. So, if you can keep the distance at least one meter, the droplets won't uh, land on you. The other thing is uh, wearing a, a medical mask in the hospital. Uh, the next uh, uh, precaution is contact precautions. Either you should not touch or avoid touching or wash your hands with water and soap or using alcohol hand rub. The next, the indirect one, uh, touching the four mites. The patients can cough on uh, and the droplet will remain on surfaces. If you touch them and touch your face, you get your, the, organ, the pathogen onto your face. And... Uh, the, so either you should not touch for my, uh, the, the surfaces often or never touch your face with contaminated hands and frequent, frequently wash your hands. The next thing is air, airborne precautions, which mainly can happen in hospitals where aerosol generating procedures are uh, undergoing, where you need to uh, either you have to um, avoid crowded places close clouded places or if it is in the hospital you should have to wear the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment such as uh, N95 mask or you call uh, respirators, goggles and gloves as well. Next. So when you talk about droplet precautions, ideally you should have a single room uh, for the patient but you know that we don't have that facility in our country but we can at least keep the patients one meter apart from each patient. Next, our main topic actually, personal protective equipment. We should have for droplet precautions, medical mask, eye protection, goggles, face shields and gown. And we should limit the movements and if, the, if you want to send the patient to somewhere for for an example, to take a, um, an ECG or X-ray, you should not send the patient through crowded corridors or so some places to avoid exposing others. Next. Contact precautions. So again, we better if we have a single room patient placement, but we, and we know that we don't have that facility, but we can cohort the patients but mainly we have to follow hand hygiene, following WHO five moments we can remember before touching the patient, before um, engaging or doing uh, aseptic procedure, after touching the patent, after body fluid exposure, and after 
touching patients around. We need to um, strongly adhere to the hand hygiene, especially in contact precaution. Apart from that, PPE would be gloves and gown. And we have to clean and disinfect the equipment because equipment may contain patient's droplets. And again, of course, frequently touched surfaces we need to clean uh, very frequently, like door handles, railings, and so on. Next, Next please. Yeah, PPE, because this is the, this, uh, the main thing in our topic. So in our airborne precautions, uh, we are uh, the aerosol uh, aerosols are generated better to have again a single room i know it's again difficult but then of course we uh, the best thing again uh, uh, negative pressure rooms again we don't have negative pressure rooms but we still have windows and so that we can make the room well ventilated but if you are a healthcare personnel who's going to a place or uh, doing a procedure where uh, aerosols are generated, definitely you need to uh, get dressed with uh, required PPE. That means respirators in 95 or equal, and eye protection with face shield or uh, goggles, gown and gloves. Next, please. Next. Uh, so, rational and correct use of uh, PPE. PPE reduces exposure to pathogens if used correctly and rationally. The effectiveness of PPE strongly depends on. Next. Next, please. Uh, staff training on putting on and removing PPE. This is something we have been doing uh, throughout this say, several months. But still, we need to continue with because still we are making mistakes. And prompt access to sufficient supplies. Initially, we know that we had some problems with the PPE. We didn't have enough surgical medical masks. Uh, in 95 masks, we still have the problem. So we have to have a, a good supply of uh, PPE. And uh, we have to follow appropriate hand hygiene as well. Next. Uh, and. Uh, the healthcare workers should comply. We, there's no point of if the patients and the, the healthcare workers are not uh, without any compliance. So we need to comply with the uh, uh, pro personal protective equipment uh, procedure. Next. And regular monitoring and feedback by infection prevention and control personnel. We have to do audits and all to see whether the uh, guidelines are followed by. Next. Next, please. Uh, rational, ra how do we use uh, personal protective equipment? Rational. So, first of all, we have to assess the risk, whether it's high risk, medium risk, low risk, and the extent of contact anticipated. Say, respiratory droplets, blood, body fluids, open skin, or aerosols, we have to consider. Uh, the risk, uh, the exposure, and what kind of a risk. Depending on that, we select the personal protective equipment uh, to wear based on this assessment. So it could be mask or a respirator, gown or overall, gloves, goggles, face shield, or boots. All depend on the uh, the risk exposure. And anyway, we always have to perform. A hand hygiene according to the WHO guideline and this should happen for each and every patient always and we, we, have, we have to make sure this is a routine. Next please. Next please. Right. These are some examples of uh, uh, previous years. Thank you. Um, examples of uh, uh, personal protective equipment. So personal protective equipment means they are for our safety, healthcare workers' safety. So gowns, uh, gloves, medical masks, respirators, face shields, goggles, and of course, boots. So these are the main ones we use for our safety. 
Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. So this is a person who had who was uh, on uh, full PPA for aerosol generating procedure. She's she's wearing a 95 mask, goggles, head cover, impermeable gown, and gloves. So this is for aerosol generating procedure. We don't have to wear this kind of attire for all the procedures. So this is what we call rational using. Next, please. General guidelines on using uh, uh, personal pr protective equipment. As I mentioned, uh, personal protective equipment should be appropriate. Whether it should be uh, indicated for this procedure particular. Frequent hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene always. Perform hand hygiene before donning and after don doffing. Uh, PP should be removed immediately after the procedure is completed. Extended use beyond the clinical area will contaminate other settings. We have to remember that really well. We can't keep on our personal protective equipment forever. I mean, very long period than it's necessary. Discard the PPE uh, in an appropriate waste container, close bin with your bag. Having the mask beyond the recommended activity will lead to higher chances of mishandling, which in turn will lead to contamination of hands and face. I have got a few pictures. Uh, next, please. Things we are doing when we are wearing something which is for a longer period than indicated. Touching, putting it down, hanging it on your neck. Next, please. on the chin and this picture may show uh, the last picture please can you see the uh, the mask hanging this is a real one all the four other four uh, pictures are not real one uh, simulated ones but the the last picture is a real one uh, where the mask used mask hangs on the table near your arm so this is what we do but we, what we need to remember these are contaminants these are containing organisms. Next, please. So use of appropriate personal protective equipment. Next, please. When? This is the question we have to ask. For an example, droplet transmission, if, if it is the problem, next, we, uh, we need, next, please, uh, we need to wear the medical mask. We don't, we don't need a uh, N95 mask or respirator. And next, please. And we should know how to use that uh, mask. Next, please. So this is a poster given by WHO. Clearly giving the way how to wear the uh, medical mask correctly. You have to wash your hands and check the mask. New one. You have to wear a new one and not a torn one. And uh, I mean, I can show you if you can see me as well. You have to check the, this is a new one. You have to check the edge with the uh, middle part. And uh, then you have to wear it well on your face, uh, covering nose and mouth and not leaving any gaps uh, on the side. And after wearing it, don't touch your mouth. And we, when you remove it, remove from the straps and don't leave it on your cells just take it off take it away and put it into a dustbin with the lid and wash your hands because mask is contaminated next please and what you should not do uh, when you wear a medical mask you should not wear a damp or used or torn mask you should not wear the mask under your nose to cover only the mouth you should not Wear the mask so that uh, there's a gap between you, the mask and the face. You should not touch the face. You, you must have seen this happening all the time, but it's wrong, it's harmful. And, uh, and the, again, you should not uh, uh, leave it hanging and don't leave it on surfaces for others to get contaminated. When you remove it, do not use the mask again. Medical mask should not be reused. 
Next, please. No mask can protect you if you wear it incorrectly. You can't say that I have worn the mask, but I got the infection because if you wore the mask correctly, you are most likely protected. But you, for the sake of doing things, don't just wear the mask on your chin or somewhere because you will not get protected, but you are making more harm than even non wearing. Next, please. So this is next thing is uh, N95 masks or respirator. So we need to wear it when aerosol generating procedures are done. Uh, first of all, as always, you have to clean your hands with alcohol hand rubber, wash your hands with soap and water, and take the mask with the straps. You have to put it on. I can show one uh, N95 mask, but I'm not going to wear it now. Uh, so you have these straps, which goes both on the back of the head and after putting it on stay very safely uh, press it so that it fits your face because in uh, we don't have the facility of uh, fit test in our hospitals what we can do is the seal, seal test only so we have to seal it and we positive seal check means you have to blow the mask and it should not go out the air should not leak from the sides or anywhere and negative seal check inhale you have to inhale deeply so the mask gets sucked onto your mouth so if so it's done correctly next please uh, if worn in 95 without a seal no protection because aerosols even though you are wearing loose hanging just imagine just because this is a 95 mask you can't just put it there just to hang unless you seal it well because Otherwise, aerosol will get into the face, onto your nose and mouth, through the gaps. Next, please. Important. Although initial fit test is, as I said, fit test is not available in most uh, uh, institutions in our country. Therefore, it is critical to uh, do the seal test. And uh, the, the other problem is, uh, what about having beard uh, and mustache? Next, please. We know since the mask should fit on your face, if you have particular different kind of mustaches or beard, you can't fit the mask onto your face well. So CDC has next place has shown some pictures where um, uh, you can have a mustache still wear the N95 safely, and uh, the incidences where you can't use with your moustache. So this is another problem. We don't take much, uh, we don't consider actually. Next, please. Putting on PAP. As I said, perform hand hygiene, put on the gown, put on the mask, put on the eye protection, put on the gloves, then you are ready to do a, uh, go to a patient. And when you're taking off, remember, this is the most important thing, even more than putting on the PPE, because uh, when you are putting off means doffing, the, all the personal protective equipments are contaminated. It contains germs. So initially, you have to remove the gloves and then the gown. And then perform hand hygiene. Because when you, you just remove the gloves and put it to a uh, yellow bean and remove the uh, gown and again put into a yellow bean and perform hand hygiene. Then afterwards, only you touch your face side. Remove the face shield and remove the mask. In between, you have to wash your hands as well. And after removing all the uh, PPE, you have to uh, wash your hands again, either wash or uh, use the alcohol hand wrap for disinfecting your um, hands. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, minimum p uh, personal protective equipment recommendation for various settings. What do we mean by minimum? Because we can wear a minimum thing for protection. We can go beyond that sometimes. That's what we do most of the time. But minimum PPE you need to have to attend a patient. For an example, uh, triage, where patients are triaged. Uh, where you don't uh, 
go to a patient very close, medical mask would be enough. But sometimes you, this is the minimum. Medical mask is a mask, but you can give a shield and you can give a gown if necessary. But minimum, you have to have a medical mask. Emergency treatment unit, providing care for the patients with respiratory symptoms. Within one meter distance, you have a medical mask, gown, gloves, apron, and eye protection. These things are musts. And then emergency procedures such as intubation, where there is possibility of aerosol. That's what I was telling. We have to think what kind of exposure, whether it is droplet, whether it is contact, whether it is aerosols. If it is aerosols, we have to have a new approved N95 mask or FFP2 standard or equal mask. We know that K95 mask is there. So we have to have a uh, respirator, um, impermeable gown, gloves, eye protection, surgical hood, cap, covered shoes, and weed resistant shoes, cover, or boots. Next, please. And some other situations. I have taken only a few uh, uh, situations. Emergency treatment unit, but cleaning staff. Cleaning after aerosol generated procedure. You don't go just after aerosol generated procedure. You let it settle a bit and then you can go with a medical mask, impermeable gown, uh, heavy duty gloves, eye protection, boots, closed shoes, surgical cap or surgical hood. And the, in patients' room, COVID 19 patients' room, uh, when we give medication, the minimum is medical mask. Impermeable gown, gloves, eye protection, surgical hood or cap, covered shoes and fluid resistant shoe cover. But of course, you know that IDH and other places, they, uh, they recommend and they use uh, N95 mask or respirator when you go near the patient. So that's what I'm telling. Minimum, we have minimum, at least we have to have a medical mask. That means you have to have a medical mask or without that, you should not go and other, uh, other people as well. But uh, when it is tricky, um, you can have a N95 mask. Uh, and then aerosol generating procedure performed on COVID-19 patient. Definitely in new approved N95 mask or uh, FFP2 standards or equivalent, impermeable gown, gloves, eye protection, goggles, apron, surgical hood or cap covered shoes. And when you transport specimen to the laboratory, you can have a medical mask and glove. So it is depending on the situation, the what uh, the PPE we use are different. So we can't have one thing for all. Like if you can put everything and go to, uh, to do all the things like taking samples, you need the goggles and so on. It's not necessary. That's why you have to think and use what is necessary rationally. Next, please. Uh, the other problem is extended use and reprocessing of PPE because we know uh, PPE there is a limit. Especially N95 respirators are limited. We don't have in the globe. It, it is global problem. Uh, we have to uh, be careful with uh, uh, PPE usage. Fortunately, in our country, we have enough uh, uh, PPE apart from N95 masks. Um, so, what about N95 mask and respirators? We have to limit it for the procedures where aerosol generating procedures, and uh, we can um, reprocess them. We can decontaminate them after use. So, for which we need to have the name on the mask marked on the strap, and we have to put use mask safely in a uh, paper bag and we can send it for decontamination to the places where decontamination is being done. Uh, for an example, from Martley we send to Candy for decontamination of uh, respirators and we get them back and reuse by the same person. So these things we have to do because we have the limit, we have to understand the limit. But all efforts should be taken to provide adequate amount. But we have to have enough PPE for the safety of healthcare workers. We have to save our healthcare workers. 
so to limit the PPE usage, one more thing we can do, engineering control, such as glass barriers uh, between patient and the healthcare workers and similar things can be done. Next, please. Summary, rational use of PPE, always practice hand hygiene. Always follow above guidelines according to healthcare setting and activity per. PPE are personal protective equipment are global, in global shortage. Uh, so be responsible for rational use. For each and everything, don't ask for N95 masks. When it is necessary, definitely we need to use. And assess the risk of exposure and use PPEs only when they are really necessary. And main thing, use it correctly because it's useless if you don't it use don't use it correctly. Next please. Next. So these are real life things I have seen recently. Can you see the mask? I think I, I have more picture. Next please. Another picture. Yes. So these things we should not do. We can't have I had another picture, but I couldn't upload it here. Uh, if you may say that, we, what do we do with the mask? If you want to have a cup of tea, or if you want to have a glass of water, we can do things. What you can do, you clean your hands with alcohol hand drug and take a clean paper bag, similar like this, and remove your mask from the straps not touching the in front and hold it um, this way to it so that i mean um, outer layer inside because this is the contaminator side and holding on the edge you can put it into a paper bag and have your cup of tea and again clean your hands with alcohol hand up and put take the mask back. Turn it right way, holding only at the edges, and put it on. And then again, clean your hands with hand. So it's not difficult, but you need to have a paper bag with you. That's all. So it, please don't do these things because it's harmful. There's no protection. You can have more chances of getting infection than not having a mask. Thank you. Next, please. Oh, sorry, I had this picture. So this is what you can do. You can clean your hands, put a, turn the mask the way I told you, and put it into the bag and have your cup of tea and clean your hands back. And you can go for your work. Because we can't throw the mask often as we want. We can use it. We use it during the day. It's not for days and days. This is for a, just a short, very short day. But after the day or after several hours, you have to throw your medical mask away. You should not reuse it. Next, please. This is the correct thing. Use your PPE correctly to save, your, save you and others. Next, please. So hope uh, you will be using the uh, personal protective equipment to protect you in future. Thank you. If there's any question. Thank you, Dr. Madhubani, for that very informative presentation. Uh, because of the interest of time, we might not be able to have uh, many questions. But okay. one question uh, regarding the difference between N95 and KN95. If okay. you want to respond briefly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, N95 and KN95 mask is supposed to be actually equal. Uh, uh, the K95 from Asian region and N95 pro from European region actually, but they have the same protection, but there's a small difference actually. K95 has um, the straps like this. Um, the the straps, is, straps are this way, so it goes onto your, uh, behind your head. But K95 uh, um, uh, goes to as ear loops. That is the difference, actually. Uh, what we can see, 
so as long as you can uh, fit the mask onto your face and you can uh, do the seal test without failing, they are equal. There's no difference, only the name. But if you use it correctly, but definitely you have to uh, test, see, do the seal test. If it's not sealed, uh, it's not good at all either even not not the not in 95 or because it, it is a particle filtration so they both filter similarly 95 percent particle filtration so they are similar thank you dr madhubani uh, so yeah. let's yeah. move into the next uh, the final part of this uh, pre-conference workshop uh, dr padma de silva the national professional officer uh, from the health systems policy is from who country office uh, he'll be introducing the video clip on the IPC training. Thank you. Over to Dr. Padman. Yes, thank you. Now, I'll just uh, give a small introduction on uh, why we made this and uh, what this is about. Now, globally, we have about one, uh, 15 million cases with around or little more than 620,000 deaths by now. And Sri Lanka, we have about 2,752 cases as at 10 o'clock today and uh, 11 days. So, I mean, our strategy had been always to uh, like uh, identify the cases and then do the contract tracing completely, get the contacts to a quarantine center and treat them at designated hospitals. So. As you can see, we have been uh, very successful in that effort. So, and in relation to health services, we have a health service that uh, recruits and then trains most of its carders. So that means we don't have uh, extra pool outside the health system. At the same time, we are running a little less than the optimal number of HR people that we are requiring. So therefore, as all the presenter presenters were highlighting, the health workforce or protecting that health workforce from this COVID pandemic and the virus had been paramount importance. So that in addition, when we were doing the case identification and quarantine and all the other activities, we had gone into a whole of society and whole of government approach where not only health services, not only the public health, but many other stakeholders had contributed and participated in these efforts. Therefore, the need for IPC was really important for Sri Lanka. And we had identified that need and ministry had made a request, uh, Dr. Panapi here, the DDG MS1 and uh, Dr. Sudhat Dharmaratna, Director of Healthcare Quality and Safety. They had communicated with us the need of uh, such, a, uh, such a venture into this and College of Microbiologists really joined with us in developing a training package of nine modules or a training module with nine sessions according to the WHO global guidelines and the Sri Lankan adaptation into it. So now today, what we are doing is at this session, we thought that it is only ample that uh, and only appropriate that we take this opportunity to put this module out. So this video clip that we are going to show you is sort of a intro and a teaser into this program. I will not uh, stop there, but I will give you a small hint at what, is, what we are going to do. So we are going to hand over these pen drives and hand, uh, like put this material on the internet for anyone to download and review. And at the same time, we are going to hand over to Dr. Sudhat uh, Dharmaratna, the Director of Healthcare Quality and Safety. Through his networks, he will distribute it among all the hospitals and the MOH officers so that all staff members of the healthcare team can benefit from this. And in, that, in addition to that, we hope that SLMA will also take an opportunity of distributing this with their counterparts, have it on their web page, and uh, so other people can download. And we want this module to be made into a Moodle-based platform course through the Directorate of Healthcare Quality and Safety, and maybe also SLMA and College of Microbiologists can join in so that it is not only available for Sri Lanka, it is available for the region and the group because it is available freely. It is available in all three languages that we speak here. Thank you. 
So let's enjoy or watch the small teaser of the video. Viruses are a large family of viruses that cause a range of illnesses, from the common cold to most severe diseases. Since the World Health Organization declared the new coronavirus a pandemic, over 14 million cases have been diagnosed and over 600,000 deaths reported globally. In Sri Lanka, only 2,724 patients and 11 deaths have been reported as at 20th July. Our health workers are the soldiers at the front line in the battle against COVID-19. In this battle, they're faced with various hazards such as exposure to pathogens, long working hours, psychological distress, occupational burnout, and so on. We need to protect them and ensure we have capable and competent health staff to care for the people of Sri Lanka. In the absence of a vaccine, infection prevention and control is the only way to prohibit the transmission of COVID-19. The Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists, Directorate of Healthcare Quality and Safety, Ministry of Health and Indigenous Medical Services, and the World Health Organization. Sri Lanka has developed training modules for our healthcare workers to enhance their knowledge and practices when responding to the outbreak in Sri Lanka. It is a pleasure to launch this training course at the 133rd anniversary of the International Medical Conference 2020, titled Professional Development for Quality Enhancement in Healthcare. These modules are based on the guidance of the World Health Organization on Infection Prevention and Control and are designed for all categories of healthcare workers. They are presented in all three languages and feature the following themes. Modes of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 causing COVID-19. Infection prevention and control in healthcare settings during the COVID-19 pandemic. Rational use of PPE and infection prevention and control of COVID-19. Use of masks as a measure to prevent COVID-19 infection. Home care for patients with respiratory symptoms. Hand hygiene and hand sanitizers. Disposal of dead body and autopsy practice guide. COVID-19 related deaths. Environmental surface disinfection during COVID-19 outbreak. Frequently asked questions and myths. Infection prevention and control related to COVID-19. The training modules will be distributed to all the training institutes of the Ministry of Health and Hospitals. They're also available for downloading online. Your assistance is appreciated to disseminate this training material. Enjoy learning, be safe, and help others to be safe from COVID-19. Once you have seen this, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, officially hand over some of these pen drives jointly uh, to President Dr. Selene. May I also uh, request Dr. Sudan to come on stage? Madam. We can give all the participants also one copy so that they can initiate the uh, dissemination of this material from today itself. Thank you, Dr. Padmal, for that uh, great service and also uh, to the WHO for this workshop. And from SLMA side, uh, what we'll be doing is tomorrow during the inauguration of the 133rd anniversary conference, we will be, we'll be inaugurating our CPD platform as well. And uh, during the CPD platform, you will be seen, you will be able to reach and access the CPD material, including this module. So then it will help for your continuous professional development and also updating. 
to conclude this workshop, the pre-conference workshop, I'd like to invite Dr. Shirani Chandrasuri, the president of the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists, for her concluding remarks. This is actually some months of work culminating in presenting this teaching material and this is the first day of dissemination. I hope all of you will use it to the maximum benefit. That will be the payment for us. Thank you, all of you.